Thank you everyone for joining us today at Levittown Public Library's uh, adult program on the Zoom. It is the world of Eleanor Roosevelt with Dr. William Theerfelder. Um, today is Wednesday, March 22nd, around two o'clock. Go ahead, Dr. Theerfelder. Thank you so very much and welcome everyone to our presentation to celebrate Women's History Month, uh, the worlds of Eleanor Roosevelt. My name is Dr. Bill Fairfelder, and I'll be your host today. Now, for those of you who do not know me, I'm a retired professor of arts and humanities. I currently live in Portland, Oregon, where I'm a lecturer, writer, and artist. But I also return regularly to my hometown of New York City, where I continue my work as a docent, a fossil explainer, and special projects editor at the American Museum of Natural History. Now, because we cannot cover everything in a 60 or 70 minute presentation, I invite you to go to my website, which is makingwings.net, where you can do a deeper dive in today's topic and frankly, dozens of others uh, as I'm about to show you. So we're gonna go to my website and you're gonna go to deeper dive number 66. Let me show you what I mean. And hopefully you are all seeing that. I had a little problem on Monday, so I want to make sure that we are sharing that screen. Okay. So making wings, there is the home page. If you go to the upper corner there, the upper right corner, you'll see a hamburger menu. And you're going to see a whole bunch of different things. Uh, but one of the highlights you will see are all these deeper dives for every presentation that I give, I create a separate uh, web page on my website. And as I say today, Eleanor Roosevelt is number 66. And so we click on that. And what you will find uh, is uh, a page that has an overview of her life. I'm going to quickly go through this. I don't want to make you dizzy. A chronology of her life suggested books and media, uh, and then uh, some selected web resources, both printed and video. So when you, for example, click on, I'm gonna click on her mother-in-law, Sarah Roosevelt. If you click on that, you'll be brought to a page about Sarah Roosevelt and all the thing you do is you shut that down and then you're brought back to my webpage. Uh, we're going to hear about two very important people in her life, Lorena Hickok, and I have material uh, about her, and then the other great person in her life, Earl Miller, uh, and we have material about him in uh, on our page. I also have materials on Eleanor Roosevelt and the Jews, very interesting uh, aspect of her life and Eleanor Roosevelt and race, which we will be discussing today. Um, and then uh, towards the bottom of the page, I have what I call 22 additional facts, very interesting things I think about her life that we don't necessarily have a chance <clears throat> to cover in today's presentation because of time. So please take advantage, deeper dive, number 66 at makingwings.net. Now, one of the things that you did see on that page uh, was uh, recommended media. So if you want a really excellent, fair-minded biography, then Eleanor by David Michaelis is a superb choice. And if you want Eleanor Roosevelt's take on her own life, then her autobiography from 1961 is where you should go. The autobiography of 61 is actually the fourth of four memoirs written by Roosevelt. Uh, the other uh, being, this is my story in 1937, this I remember, 1949, and on my own, 1958. Now she combined all three of those with additional material into this 1961 text, simply called the autobiography of Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, the book has always been well received by critics who particularly appreciate the combined memoirs. Uh, it really shows Eleanor's development. So I recommend that one 
uh, really quite strongly. Now, an aspect of Roosevelt's life that remains both controversial and essential to a full understanding of the woman is her relationship with other women. Um, Empty Without You, which is actually a line from one of her letters to Lorena Hickok, uh, editor, uh, edited by Roger Straitmatter, uh, is a collection of selected letters between Roosevelt and the reporter Lorena Hickok that leave little doubt about the nature of their friendship. It's riveting reading. Uh, we have over 3,000 letters. This is before email and text messaging. So we have over 3,000 letters exchanged between the two of them. It's really quite something. Now, if you want something visual, if you want a documentary about Roosevelt, then Sue Williams' biography for the PBS series, American Experience, is really a go-to book, uh, excuse me, a DVD. Um, it's two and a half hours long, but it's absolutely worth every, every minute. So uh, let's begin. For more than 30 years, Eleanor Roosevelt was America's most powerful woman. Millions adored her, but her FBI file was thicker than a stack of phone books. She spoke out fearlessly for civil rights, but the KKK had a price on her head. She helped Franklin Delano Roosevelt rise to power and was one of his most valuable political assets, but the media satirized her as an unattractive busybody. So she was born to wealth and power, but was orphaned by the age of 10. Her private life was marked by tragedy, infidelity, and a never-ending search for intimacy. Yet she persevered, fighting tirelessly for social justice for all and taking a leading role in the United Nations landmark Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, so really, there's the many worlds of Eleanor Roosevelt. Now, to tell this story, I'm going to use a timeline approach with a few sidebars along the way. And again, for a much deeper dive, go to my website, number 66. Um, and I love this, to get us started, this great quote, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Love it. Right on, Eleanor. Well, let's begin. 1884. Anna Eleanor Roosevelt was born on October 11th of that year in New York City to the socialites Anna Rebecca Hall and Elliot Roosevelt, who was the brother of Theodore Roosevelt. Through her mother, she was a niece of tennis champions Valentine Hall and Edward Ludlow Hall. From an early age, she preferred to be called by her middle name, Eleanor. Her mother nicknamed her Granny because she acted in such a serious manner as a child. Her mother, whose name was also Anna, it wasn't unusual for uh, not only sons to be named after their fathers, but mother, the children to be uh, girls to be named after their mothers. So that's probably the reason why, to avoid confusion, she didn't want to be called Anna because that was her mother's name. So, but her mother Anna, um, yeah, not such a great relationship. Uh, she kind of emotionally rejected little Eleanor and was also somewhat ashamed, and we have this in written records, somewhat ashamed of her daughter's alleged, quote unquote, plainness. Uh, in, by 1892, uh, this slide here, Elliot Roosevelt, Eleanor's father, very much loved his children, but especially Eleanor seen here on his right. Unfortunately, he was also an alcoholic, and in 1892 made the first of several visits to a sanitarium to deal with his drinking problem. Sadly, Eleanor's mother, Anna, died of diphtheria in 1892, which sent Elliot into a permanent downward spiral. Her father died on August the 14th of 1894, just two years later, after jumping from the window of a sanitarium during a fit of delirium tremens, which is a, an alcohol-induced hallucination. He survived the fall, but died from a seizure a few days later. 
the death certificate clearly states that alcoholism was the contributing cause. Roosevelt's childhood losses left her prone to depression throughout her life. After the deaths of her parents, Roosevelt was raised in the household of her maternal grandmother, Mary Livingston Ludlow, in Manhattan and in Tripoli, New York, uh, which is seen on your screen. One view there, and here's another view of that place. And uh, so as a child, um, though she was insecure and starving for affection and often considers herself an ugly duckling, she was taken care of and frankly did live an upper crust kind of life. Well, despite being the supposed ugly duckling of the family, we have this, this is interesting. She's 14 years old, she already is keeping a diary and she writes this. No matter how plain a woman may be, if truth and loyalty are stamped upon her face, all will be attracted to her. So she really tried to compensate, to work through this perpetual kind of microaggression bullying by her family about her looks. And she says this, so quite a, quite a strong thing to say in a good way, a strong thing. Well, after Roosevelt was tutored privately, she was sent to Allenswood Academy at the age of 15, which was a private finishing school in Wimbledon, London, England, where she was educated from 1899 to 1902. The uh, headmistress there, Marie Sylvestre, was a noted educator who sought to cultivate independent thinking in young women. Sylvestre took a special interest in Roosevelt, who learned to speak French fluently and gained self-confidence. And at the school, and I put the little arrow there, there, there's her class and there she is in the back row. At school, Roosevelt was beloved by everyone, not just the headmistress. Well, when President McKinley was assassinated six months after his second inauguration in 1901, Uncle Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt, assumed the presidency. At the behest of family members, Eleanor reluctantly left Allenswood in England and made her society debut at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. And she was 18. And that is her, what was called her coming out uh, picture, coming out into New York society. <clears throat> the following year, <clears throat> Eleanor became engaged to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, her fifth cousin once removed. She also enrolled in the Junior League of New York, where she taught calisthenics and dancing to immigrants. And further, Eleanor joined the Consumers League and investigated working conditions in the garment districts. <clears throat> in 1905, March 17th, in fact, good old St. Patrick's Day, Eleanor married Franklin Delano Roosevelt in New York, and it was Uncle Teddy Roosevelt who gave her away, and, <clears throat> and he was nearly the star of the show. It's a great picture there. She is in her, her wedding dress. Well, 1906 to 1916. Over the course of the next 10 years, Eleanor gave birth to six children. And I've listed them there over on your left. Anna Eleanor Roosevelt, James Roosevelt, the first Franklin Delano Roosevelt Jr. who died of influenza within weeks of his birth, Elliot Roosevelt, the second Franklin Delano Roosevelt Jr. This was not an unusual thing, by the way, if you named a child um, either a daughter or a son and they died, you could name a next child or a child down the line, 
give them the same name. It was a common practice. And finally, last but not least, John Aspinwall Roosevelt. And as you can see, um, they all lived fairly decent lives living into the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Now, though this family portrait from the early 1920s shows an apparently happy family, oh, there were several problems. And one of the biggest problems was Franklin's mother, Sarah. And that brings us to our sidebar about Sarah. Now, here's as good a place as any to talk about and talk about and pause and talk about Sarah. After their honeymoon, the newlyweds settled in a New York City townhouse that was built for them by mother-in-law Sarah, as well as a second residence called Springwood at the family's estate overlooking the Hudson River in Hyde Park, New York. So from the beginning, Eleanor had to have this relationship with her mother-in-law who literally, <laughs> they lived here and mother lived next door. She literally had doorways leading between her house and uh, their house, right? Okay, so from the beginning, Eleanor had a contentious relationship with her controlling mother-in-law. And as I said, the townhouse that Sarah gave to them was connected to her own residence by sliding doors, not even a locking door, a sliding door. And Sarah ran, she just decided, she ran both households in the decade after the marriage. Well, early on, Eleanor, she ended up having a nervous breakdown. And she said to Franklin, and we have this in writing, I don't like to live in a house which is not in any way mine, one that I have done nothing about and which does not represent the way I want to live. But Franklin didn't listen, no one listened and nothing changed. Sarah also sought to control the raising of her grandchildren. And Eleanor later reflected, you can find this in her autobiography, that Franklin's children were more my mother-in-law's children than they were mine. Indeed, Roosevelt's eldest son, James, remembered Sarah telling her grandchildren, your mother only bore you. I am more your mother than your mother is. Ouch. And to add to the horror, Roosevelt, she disliked having sex with her husband. She once told her daughter, Anna, that it was an ordeal I had to endure. She also considered herself ill-suited to motherhood. Later writing, again in the autobiography, it did not come naturally to me to understand little children and to enjoy them. So that's uh, Sarah and the early years of that marriage. Well, let's go back to our timeline. Eleanor attended her first Democratic Party convention in 1912, which was held in Baltimore and went on to nominate New Jersey Governor Woodrow Wilson. Uh, here you see uh, Eleanor in 1912, same year, with Franklin at their summer home in Campobello, New Brunswick, Canada. They had a home there in Canada, a summer home. In 1913, FDR started to move up the political ladder when he became assistant secretary of the Navy. But this was also the year that Eleanor hired Lucy Mercer, who you see over here in your, on your right. She hired her as her social secretary. Oh, that was a move she would come to regret, as you will see. Meanwhile, 1914 to 1917, war broke out in Europe. Now, the United States tried to remain neutral, but finally declared war on December 7th uh, in 1917, a date that would become even more, quote unquote, infamous 24 years later when we entered another war on that date. Germany's submarine attacks on passenger and merchant ships in 1917 became the primary motivation and the final straw uh, behind President Wilson's decision to lead the United States into war. 
Well, 1918 was a momentous year. The Treaty of Versailles was ratified and it ended World War I. Further, the House of Representatives also passed the amendment to grant women suffrage, a cause near and dear to Eleanor. And of course it was finally enacted within a couple of years. But for Eleanor, the real importance of 1918 was far more personal. In September of 1918, Roosevelt was unpacking one of her husband Franklin's suitcases when she discovered a bundle of love letters sent to him from her social secretary, Lucy Mercer, uh, seen in, in the, uh, on the right in her mature years. He had been contemplating leaving his wife for Mercer. However, following pressure from his political advisor and from his mother, Sarah, who threatened to disinherit Franklin if he followed through with a divorce, the couple remained married. Their union from that point on was more of a political partnership. It's kind of like a Hill and Billary, uh, uh, Billary, <laughs> uh, Hillary and Bill Clinton uh, relationship. Disillusioned, Eleanor again became active in public life and focused increasingly on her social work rather than on her role as a wife. That's going to change a little bit. 1921. Now, on your left, you see the Roosevelt family at Campobello uh, in this case in 1920. We're going to focus on 1921 in a moment. Well, look at that picture. <laughs> Frankly, no one in this photo looks particularly happy. Is anyone actually smiling? I'm looking at it again. No. Oh, and, and, and oh, look at Sarah. You know, please, sitting between the husband and the wife, and Eleanor is looking down. I mean, this is this is like Charles and Diana, too. I mean, really. Okay, anyway. It's the height of this power struggle between Eleanor and, and Sarah. Well, in the summer of 1921, August specifically, the family was vacationing on Campobello when Franklin seen on uh, the right side in, in later years, um, was diagnosed with polio. Now, it was a condition that he would hide from public eyes for much of the rest of his life in very masterful ways. He was always photographed standing behind a podium or standing with someone next to him who was actually holding him up or he was seated, was photographed of him seating. Very, he really didn't want people to see him with crutches or in a wheelchair. Well, meanwhile, in 1921, during the onset of the illness, Eleanor put aside her personal pain over FDR's infidelity and through her nursing care, she probably saved Franklin from death. His legs remained permanently paralyzed, but he was alive to tell the story. And that, in great part, was due to Eleanor. In fact, when the extent of his disability became clear, Eleanor fought a protracted battle with Sarah over FDR's future, persuading him to stay in politics despite Sarah's urgings that he retire and become a country gentleman. In fact, Franklin's attending physician, Dr. William Keene, commended Eleanor's devotion to the stricken Franklin. He said, you have been a rare wife and have borne your heavy burden most bravely, he said, proclaiming her one of my heroines. Well, this whole experience proved a turning point in Eleanor and Sarah's long running struggle. And as Eleanor's public role grew, she increasingly broke from Sarah's control. 1922. Eleanor joining uh, the women's division of the New York State Democratic Party, uh, De De Democratic Committee, I should say, uh, was an important step in establishing her own political credibility. But far more important in that year was her becoming friends with Nancy Cook, and Marion Dickerman, a prominent lesbian couple. 
As her relationship with Franklin became more and more a working relationship, her relationships with women, especially gay women like Nancy and Marion, proved to be the foundation upon which she could build an emotionally fulfilling life. And that brings us to our next sidebar called Val Q. Tensions between Sarah and Eleanor over her new political friends rose to the point that the family constructed a cottage on the Hyde Park property on the Hudson River, which Eleanor called Val Kill, uh, loosely translated as waterfall stream from the Dutch language common to the original European settlers of the area. Here, Eleanor and her guests lived when Franklin and the children were away from the main house at Hyde Park. Val Kill was created by and shared with her friends, Nancy Cook and Marion Dickerman. And with encouragement from FDR, Eleanor, Nancy, and Marion established Val Kill Industries to employ local farming families in handcraft traditions. And each year for decades, Eleanor held a picnic at Val Kill for delinquent boys. Simply put, Val Kill was Eleanor's castle. It was far away from Sarah. <laughs> Eleanor frequently used Val Kill's relaxed setting for entertaining family, friends, and political associates, and even world leaders. This was her turf. Even when Franklin and Sarah came over from the main house to a visit. <laughs> Nancy and Marion sold their interest in the property to Eleanor shortly after the death of her husband, Franklin, in 1945. Val Kill then became Eleanor's primary residence for the rest of her life and the place most associated with her. After her death in 1962, Val Kill was converted into rental units and later sold to developers, but a public campaign ensued to save Val Kill, and it was declared a National Historic Site in 1977. The beautifully restored site is now managed by the National Park Service. So if you're ever up at Hyde Park, definitely visit Val Kill. Okay, back to our timeline. In 1926, Eleanor, Dickerman and Cook purchased Todd Hunter School on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, a very well-regarded finishing school where Eleanor taught history and government. In 1939, uh, Todd Hunter became part of the prestigious Dalton School, uh, which still exists and is a co-educational college prep school. Uh, you can see its current 89th Street building on the left of your screen. Uh, here are uh, some notes uh, that Eleanor made for one of her history lectures. And uh, yep, yeah, here is uh, Eleanor attending a science class. And here she is with some of her students on a trip to Mount Vernon, Virginia. Now, in 1927, Eleanor met Mary McLeod Bethune, president of Bethune Cookman College and a long friendship ensued. Bethune became a trusted advisor to Eleanor, opening her eyes to the continued struggles of Black Americans. It was a powerful, very transformative relationship, and Eleanor became a lifelong advocate of Black causes. Now, in 1928, the Democratic National Committee appointed Eleanor director of the Bureau of Women's Activities, and Franklin was elected governor of New York State, in great part due to Eleanor's tireless campaigning. Yet when Eleanor refused to be driven in the official limousine, preferring to drive herself, well, Franklin agreed, but he assigned Earl Miller, whom you see on the right, to be her personal bodyguard. And that brings us to our next sidebar, Earl Miller. 
Now, because Franklin's polio-induced paralysis kept him from regularly touring the state, not only when he was campaigning, but when he was governor, Eleanor began making state visits and inspections in his place, accompanied by Miller. Now, in the course of these trips, Eleanor and Earl Miller quickly became close. Uh, Miller gave Eleanor riding lessons, as you can see on your screen, and coached her in tennis and swimming. He even taught her how to shoot targets with a pistol. And he later uh, bought her a chestnut mare named Dorothy, nicknamed Dot, which you see there. And it was called Dot because if you look at the ho uh, horse, you know, it's that big dot in the middle of her forehead. And Eleanor rode Dot regularly. He also encouraged her to develop self-confidence, a trait Eleanor often lacked. Eleanor considered herself not photogenic and attempted to hide from photographers early in her political career. While Miller encouraged her to face reporters and, and smile, what the hell, right? Just smile, kid. And on occasion, he actually stood behind photographers and made funny faces at her so that she would laugh and smile. Now, Roosevelt scholars continue to discuss whether Eleanor and Earl were more than good friends. It's certainly open to conjecture. Roosevelt biographer Blanche Cook called Miller, quote, the first romantic involvement of Eleanor's middle years, unquote, but also stated that it was impossible to determine if the two were ever physically involved. Eleanor's son, James, see him popping up there on the right of your screen, good looking lad. Uh, he said, Earl was the one real romance in mother's life outside of her marriage. He encouraged her to take pride in herself, to be herself, to be unafraid of facing the world. He did a lot for her. She seemed to draw strength from him when he was by her side and she came to rely on him. He became part of the family, too, and gave her a great deal of what her husband and we, her sons, failed to give her. Above all, he made her feel that she was a woman. Well, Roosevelt and Miller's relationship uh, lasted and continued until her death in 1962. Um, they are thought to have corresponded daily. But all of those letters have been mysteriously, quote unquote, lost. Who knows? According to rumor, those letters were anonymously purchased and destroyed, perhaps locked away when she died. We really don't know what happened to them. But again, just as with later on Lorena Hickok, there are, were supposedly thousands of letters over many years from 1928 all the way to her death in 1962. Well, let's go back to the timeline. After the stock market crash in 1929, that doomed the Hoover administration, Franklin Roosevelt was elected president of the United States in 1932, with Eleanor doing a huge amount of the campaigning. But there were other things that proved to be essential to Eleanor's life in 1932. One was uh, a close friendship with aviatrix Amelia Earhart, with whom she flew in 1933. But even more important was the beginning of her relationship with the journalist Lorena Hickok. After covering, and there she is, after covering Franklin's first presidential campaign, Hickok struck up a close friendship with Eleanor and traveled with her extensively. And that brings us to this sidebar. So we have Earl Miller on the one hand, and on the other hand, we have Lorena Hickok. And the nature of Eleanor and Lorena's relationship has been widely debated. Because this time, the letters do exist. 3,000 of their mutual letters were discovered uh, after uh, uh, Eleanor's death. And those letters seem to confirm physical intimacy. The closeness of uh, their relationship compromised Hickok's objectivity, and that led her to resign from the Associated Press and her work as the chief investigator for the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. 
She later served as executive secretary of the women's division of the Democratic National Committee. And she actually lived mostly at the White House where Hickok had a conjoining room with the first lady. So they had adjoining rooms in the White House, wink, wink. In 2011, essay, an essay by Russell Baker stated that Hickok's relationship was indeed erotic, now seems beyond dispute, considering what is known about the letters they exchanged. Several hundreds of those letters are available for all to read uh, in this collection. Uh, and they're quite beautiful. Um, the title of that collection is Empty Without You. And that is what Eleanor wrote in one of her letters to Lorena. But this leads us to another sidebar. Oh, there were other relationships going on here. Roosevelt's close friendships with both Miller and Hickok occurred at the same time that her husband had a rumored relationship with his secretary, Missy LeHand. FDR's biographer, Gene Smith, writes, remarkably, both Eleanor and Franklin recognized, accepted, and encouraged their extramarital arrangements. Eleanor and Franklin were strong-willed people who cared greatly for each other's happiness, but realized that their own, in, realized their own inability to actually provide for it. So Franklin wanted Eleanor to be happy. Eleanor wanted Franklin to be happy, but they realized they couldn't bring each other happiness. So if you find it outside of the marriage, mazel tov, enjoy. Back to the timeline, 1933. In 1933, Eleanor became the first wife of a president to hold all female press conferences. And you could see her press corps there, it's all women. She also assisted with the Arthur Dale Homestead Project for coal miners in West Virginia. It was one of the first planned communities developed through FDR's New Deal initiatives. Unfortunately, 1933 was also the year of the Dust Bowl that devastated the Midwest, and it was an environmental disaster that greatly disturbed Eleanor. 1934. In 1934, not only did Eleanor assist with the formation of the National Youth Administration, but she coordinated meetings between FDR and NAACP leader Walter White to discuss anti-lynching legislation. Well, this meeting between FDR and Walter White, which was kind of not coerced is the wrong word, but it was certainly set up by Eleanor, uh, didn't go so well. Um, in fact, FDR said to White, somebody's been priming you. Was it my wife? <laughs> well, he was annoyed. And why was he annoyed? Yeah, he was a politician. If I come out for the anti-lynching bill now, Southern Democrats will block every bill I ask Congress to pass to keep America from collapsing. I just can't take the risk. Okay, let, let me explain something here. We have to remember that until President Johnson in the 1960s, the South was solidly Democratic. It was the Republican Party almost the obverse of what it is today. It was the Republican Party that was behind civil rights legislation. Once the Civil Rights Act of the mid 60s was passed, again, under President Johnson, the South basically felt betrayed and it became a bastion as it is to this day of conservative Republicanism. 1935. Roosevelt also began a syndicated newspaper column called My Day, which appeared six days a week from December the 31st of 1935 until her death in 1962. It's one of the longest live columns uh, in American journalism. In the column, she wrote about her daily activities, but also her humanitarian concerns. 
And then on top of that, from 1941 until her death in 1962, she wrote a second column, which was called If You Ask Me. It was first published in Ladies Home Journal and then later in McCall's magazine. For those of you of a certain age, you may remember those magazines. So choice, if you ask me, columns were published in a 2018 collection, which I've put up now on the left of the screen. It's uh, edited by Mary Jo Binker. Um, it, it, you can buy it. It's really lots of fun to read. Well, comes 1936, and FDR wins, uh, runs for election, and he wins. In fact, he wins. He's an electoral victor in 46 of the 48 states. Um, and again, it's with a great deal of uh, campaigning from uh, Eleanor. And the background photo on your screen uh, shows uh, uh, them celebrating in a motorcade with their daughter, Anna, sitting here in the middle. Well, much to the chagrin of her husband, Eleanor continued her personal battle against segregation. And one of the great examples occurred in April of 1939. After the Daughters of the American Revolution refused to provide a venue for the famous opera singer, Marian Anderson, Eleanor arranged for Anderson to sing at the Lincoln Memorial on Easter Sunday. And you can see the famous moment there on your screen. And by the way, on my website, I actually have a, a video link if you want to hear uh, Marian Anderson singing at that famous uh, concert. It's all thanks to Eleanor. Well, in 1940, Eleanor made an impromptu speech at the Democratic National Convention, which absolutely helped FDR win an unprecedented third term in office. Of course, it was the following year, December 7th. Remember, Treaty of Versailles signed December the 7th of 1917. Well, on December the 7th of 1941, of course, we know Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and the U.S. entered the Second World War. Well, within weeks, Eleanor was involved, eventually going to frontline camps to be with American troops. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But this does bring us to another remarkable sidebar, and it's about the Tuskegee Airmen. As part of her firm commitment to both the war effort and civil rights causes, Eleanor was very interested in the work at the Tuskegee Institute's Aeronautical School. During a highly publicized 1941 visit to the Tuskegee Army Airfield, she asked to take a flight with one of the Tuskegee pilots. Now you could just imagine some white people, you know, having a collective heart attack here. But she says, you know, fly me. Well, the Secret Service, of course, was like, oh, my God, what if something happens? They were anxious. But she said, no, nope, I'm going to do it. And you don't stand in the way of Eleanor. <laughs> so Chief Civilian Flight Instructor Charles Af uh, Alfred Anderson, who's known today as the quote unquote father of black aviation, he piloted Mrs. Roosevelt over the skies of Alabama for over an hour. And evidently the woman absolutely loved it. And now look at this plane. I mean, this is an open airplane, but supposedly she was like going, we, you know, and just having a grand old time flying over Alabama uh, with her, you know, black pilot, Char Chuck Anderson. <laughs> well, flying with Anderson demonstrated the depth of Eleanor Roosevelt's support for black pilots and the Institute's training program. Press coverage of her adventure in flight helped advocate for the competency of these pilots and boosted the Institute's visibility. You know, once again, right? Blacks had to prove that they had the intelligence to fly an airplane. I mean, it, it just boggled uh, the mind of Eleanor that they actually had to go through this, but you know, she, she helped. And she was so impressed with the program that she established and maintained a long correspondence with several of the airmen, including Charles Anderson. 
Uh, that 99th Flighter Squadron, by the way, became the first all-Black flying squadron and the first to deploy overseas to North Africa, to Sicily, and other parts of Italy. And the 332nd Fighter Group, which were nicknamed the Red Tails because they painted the tails of their P-47s bright red, earned 96 distinguished flying crosses. And of course, Eleanor was beaming through all of this. They continued to face terrible bigotry within and without the armed forces, but Eleanor was proud and she continued to fight for them long after the war was over. Now, I told you we're going to go back to a moment to Eleanor and, and the war, and here you see it. 1943, you see um, on your map there on your screen the numerous places visited by Eleanor. You see all those little red lines. These are all places that she visited uh, in the South Pacific in an effort to boost the soldiers' morale. She visited hospitals. She hobnobbed with officers, and she even went, I mean, this caused multiple heart attacks, I'm sure, within the Secret Service, but she even went to frontline battlefields. It was a logistical nightmare for the Secret Service and the military, but Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, oh, she got her way most of the time. Simply put, Eleanor Roosevelt did things that no First Lady had ever done before, and something few after her would. Well, then comes 1945. In one of her proudest achievements, Eleanor influenced the Army Nurse Corps to open its membership to Black women. Finally, we're Black nurses. She also joined the board of directors of the NAACP. In May, Germany surrendered, ending the European War. And after America drops two atomic bombs, Japan surrendered to the Allies on September 2nd, thus officially ending World War II. But for Eleanor, 1945, April 12th changed her life forever. Franklin dies and years of emotional complexity were brought to the forefront. And this, brings us to another sidebar, which I call Love and Betrayal. There's Franklin and there's daughter Anna. Despite Roosevelt's promise to Eleanor, he did keep in contact with Lucy Mercer over the years. This is now separate from his relationship with Missy LeHand. Okay, so this is the first liaison, Lucy. Well, Lucy was over time a married woman. Well, Lucy's husband died in March of 1944. So in June of 1944, Franklin Roosevelt asked his daughter, Anna, you see them there on the screen, who was then managing some White House social functions and acting as a hostess, he asked her whether she would help him arrange meetings with Lucy without Eleanor's knowledge. She's an unmarried woman now, so, hmm. Well, aware of Lucy's role in her parents' early marriage, Anna was at first angry that her father would put her in such a difficult position. However, she, with some persuasion, ultimately relented, and she set up a meeting in Georgetown. Well, to her surprise, Anna found that she actually liked Lucy. And the pair actually became good friends. There were supposedly a number of dinners in the White House's second floor private quarters, which you see on your screen, the second floor dining room there. These took place in Roosevelt's last year, 44 into 45, which were attended by Lucy, usually in a group with Anna's presence and obvious acceptance. Well, in early April of 1945, Anna arranged for Lucy to come to meet her father at what he called his little white house in Warm Springs, Georgia. It's a small, plain, rustic cottage built at the polio therapy center there, um, which had heated mineral waters and so forth. Well, Roosevelt actually helped develop that resort 
uh, in the 1920s. So Lucy, along with two of Franklin's cousins, were sitting there on the early afternoon of April the 12th of 1945, when Roosevelt suddenly placed his hand on his forehead and temple, saying, supposedly these are his last words, I have a terrific headache. And then he slumped over and he lost consciousness, never to regain it. Well, Lucy and the cousins and Anna quickly call doctors and two doctors come in and pronounce him dead. And they say that he suffered a fatal cerebral hemorrhage. Well, Lucy, of course, had to be immediately removed from the situation. So she packed and left the cottage. Okay, plot thickens. Eleanor soon learns the truth about that afternoon from those two cousins that were in attendance. And she felt doubly betrayed to learn of her daughter's role, not only in that deception, but in the past year, the deception of the dinners at the White House and stuff like that. And as a result, the friendship between Eleanor and Anna, which was once so strong, remained cool for many years. And eventually uh, it did heal. Uh, and you could see a, kind of a, a happy Anna and Eleanor with a grandchild on the screen. Okay, so what about the mistress, Lucy? Well, bless Eleanor. She decided to take the high road. She actually mailed to Lucy an unfinished portrait by Elizabeth Shumatov that Lucy had commissioned. Shumatov was actually working on it the day that FDR died. And there is the incomplete watercolor. So she was working on this. So we have this, we have Lucy, we have the cousins, we have Anna, uh, we have Shumatov, we have all these people in attendance. This, this little harem uh, is in attendance on his last day and she's you know, creating this watercolor. And so what does Eleanor do? After Franklin dies, she mails this piece of art that you see on the left of your screen. She mails it to Lucy with actually a very beautiful, there's no, there's no passive aggressive language in it or what's a very beautiful letter. I, I, I thought that you might want to have this because of your closeness to Franklin. And um, by the way, here is the finished version of Shumatov's uh, painting, which he did in oils uh, that she did at a later date. Well, 46, 47. So within a year of Franklin's death, Eleanor was elected as head of the United Nations Human Rights Commission. Remember, it was a very new organization at this time. And one of the first things she did was she began to draft what was called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. She also initiated the creation of Americans for Dem Democratic Action, a group which continues to focus on domestic social reform and humanitarian causes around the world. So since 1947, still exists today. Well, Eleanor was no stranger to speaking, but now unleashed from the burdens of her mother-in-law, who had died in 1941, her philandering husband, and a host of other domestic entanglements, she became a free bird. She became a media darling, and she energetically pursued humanitarian projects. She appeared on radio and television regularly and spoke about humanitarian and social justice causes whenever asked for the rest of her life around the world. Well, Eleanor was her usual busy self uh, in 1948. She spoke on the struggles for the rights of man at the Sorbonne during a meeting of the United Nations General Assembly in Paris and joined her daughter Anna for a radio discussion program on the ABC network. By this point, the feelings of betrayal had ebbed. And in December, thanks in great part to the tireless efforts of Eleanor, 
uh, that human rights declaration was passed by the United Nations. Uh, what I'd like uh, to do at this point is um, give you a sense of that very uh, immediately identifiable voice of hers. Let's listen to her as she speaks about this moment. And now this is a very old newsreel, so you may have to adjust the sound on your devices and the, the video quality is, is horrible, but it gives you a sense of Eleanor. And here she is speaking at the United Nations. We stand today at the threshold of a great event, both in the life of the United Nations and in the life of mankind. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights may well become the international Magna Carta of all men everywhere. We hope its proclamation by the General Assembly will be an event comparable to the proclamation of the Declaration of the Rights of Man by the French people in 1789, the adoption of the Bill of Rights by the people of the United States, and the adoption of comparable declarations at different times in other countries. So there you have a, a, a little bit, but you know, she really, you know, this was her thing. This was her wheelhouse. I love that. And of course, that immediately uh, <laughs> recognizable voice. This is Eleanor Roosevelt, you know. Uh, but 1948 was important for another reason. And I have a sidebar here. And it's anti-Semitism and Israel. And I do have, as you may remember, I have some things about this on my website. So in 1948, Eleanor threatened to resign from uh, the United Nations if President Truman didn't recognize the statehood of Israel. Now on the left, you see her with David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first prime minister. And on the right is an uh, Israeli stamp commemorating Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, wonderful support. This is a shift. Earlier in his life, she had a very typical, often negative, upper-class Protestant view of Jews. And when she was co-owner of the Todd Hunter School in Manhattan, remember that in the 1930s? A limited number of Jews were admitted, just a limited number. She said the problem was that Jews were, quote, very unlike ourselves, unquote, and had not yet become American enough. <laughs> but her barely veiled anti-Semitism, well, that declined rapidly. Not only after the horrors of Hitler's Germany became widely known, but especially because of her growing and understanding friendship with Bernard Baruch, who had been an advisor to her husband during World War II. In fact, after the war, she became a staunch champion of Israel which she admired for its a commitment to New Deal values. And for the rest of her life, she supported and championed Jewish causes. Now, I like to tell this story because it's very representative of Eleanor Roosevelt as a person. She was always willing to hear another side of an argument. And she would change her mind about issues if there was a coherent, logical reason to do so. So rather than seeing her change of positions on issues as waffling, as it's sometimes called in political circles, she saw her ability to change her mind and, and, and kind of repent and, and look at things in a new way as a sign of growth and spiritual maturity. Well, in 1952, Eleanor resigned from the United Nations to campaign for Adlai Stevenson for the presidency. She and Stevenson, a soft-spoken intellectual, remained close friends and colleagues until her death, and both worked together in various capacities at the United Nations, which you see on your left. In 1954, the Brown versus Board of Education decision by the Supreme Court outlawed segregation in public schools, 
And this was something that Eleanor had long fought for. So she saw the decision as a moral victory for America. And along those same lines, Eleanor was an ardent support supporter of Martin Luther King uh, from his Montgomery bus boycott days in 1955 and 1956 until her death six years later. King called Mrs. Uh, Roosevelt, quote, perhaps the greatest woman of our time, unquote. In his epitaph for Mrs. FDR, published shortly after her death in November of 1962, MLK praised the courage she displayed in taking sides on matters considered controversial and her, quote, unswerving dedication to high principle and purpose, unquote. Uh, the photo on your screen shows Dr. King being honored at the 1961 Roosevelt Day Dinner sponsored by the Americans for Democratic Action at New York's Astor Hotel. Herbert H. Lehman, former governor of New York, as well as its senator during the 1950s, is on the left, with Robert Schwartz, the New York State chairman of the ADA, standing behind her. Well, in 1957, Eleanor visited the Soviet Union as a representative of the New York Post and met with Nikita Khrushchev and other high-ranking Soviet officials to talk about important humanitarian issues. Now, by the way, for those of you familiar with New York City, you probably know that the New York Post, now a very ultra-conservative tabloid, was once the bastion of liberal politics. So the newspaper's connection with Eleanor Roosevelt, civil rights, and prominent labor union activists was not unexpected. So they sponsored her trip to Russia. Now, of course, now under the Murdoch family, oh, that's quite different. On December, excuse me, on September the 9th of 1957, President Dwight Eisenhower signed into law the first civil rights legislation since Reconstruction after it outlasted the longest filibuster to that point in the history of the US Senate, paving the way for the civil rights bills that Johnson would pass in the 1960s. Well, Congress would pass it, but it was Johnson who kind of pushed it through. This legislation in 1957 was something Eleanor had campaigned for vigorously. The new act established the civil rights section of the Justice Department and empowered federal prosecutors to obtain court injunctions against interference with the right to vote. Now, the photograph shows the president with Everett Frederick Murrow, who was the first African-American to hold an executive position at the White House. He served President Eisenhower as administrative officer for special projects from 1955 until the end of his administration in 1961. Well, despite threats from the Ku Klux Klan, remember they had <laughs> they had a bounty out on her, Eleanor spoke at a civil rights workshop in 1958 at the Highlander Folk School in Tennessee, which you see on your screen. And it wasn't the first time that ER went into the Deep South to encourage civil rights activism. And it wasn't the first time that the Klan had threatened her. In fact, during the late 1950s, her work so angered the Klan that they actually put a $25,000 bounty on her. And that's $25,000 in 1950s money. I mean, it's a six-figure sum today. Eleanor, who also supported John F. Kennedy's presidential campaign, was reappointed in 1961 as part of the American delegation to the United Nations by the president. Well, there, she, she was a rock star. They treated her like royalty. In addition, Kennedy also appointed her as chair of the President's Commission on the Status of Women, and she monitored and reported the efforts and progress for fi the fight for civil rights in the United States. I love this photograph of her. She's listening so intently. In April of 1960, 
Roosevelt was diagnosed with aplastic anemia soon after being struck by a car in New York City. Well, in 1962, a couple of years later, she was given steroids to help with this condition. Unfortunately, the steroids activated a dormant case of tuberculosis in her bone marrow. And she died on November the 7th of TB, actually, age 78, from a cardiac failure as a result of the TB that the steroids induced. Uh, she passed in her Manhattan home, which you see on your screen, on 74th Street in Upper East Side of New York. She was cared for by her daughter, Anna, during this final illness. President John F. Kennedy ordered all United States flags lowered to half staff throughout the world on November 8th in tribute to Roosevelt. Funeral services were held two days later in Hyde Park on the Hudson, where she was interred next to her husband in the Rose Garden at Springwood Estate, the Roosevelt family home. Attendees, as you can see in the picture, included President Kennedy, Vice President Lyndon Johnson, and former Presidents Truman and Eisenhower, all of whom honored Roosevelt. So what I'd like to do at this point, it's about four minutes long, I'd like to sum up some of the things we've just looked at. It's a nice way to wrap things up. Here's a brief video from the History Channel. Uh, and once again, you may have to adjust the sound on your devices. There are no closed captioning, so you may want to adjust the sound. Uh, but I think it's a nice way to wrap up our look at this remarkable woman. Here we are. I think every first lady since Eleanor Roosevelt is measured against Eleanor Roosevelt because she did completely transform this role. Anna Eleanor Roosevelt was born in New York City on October 11th, 1884. She was born into a life of privilege, but it was a difficult childhood. When Eleanor was eight years old, her mother died very suddenly. And two years later, her father died of alcoholism. So she was an orphan by the time she was 10 years old. At age 14, Eleanor was sent to a boarding school in London. The experience would be a major turning point in her life. The headmistress of this school, a woman named Marie Suvestra, was actually a radical, a feminist, and she wasn't educating these girls just to go off and get married. She was educating them to be leaders. In 1902, Eleanor met her father's fifth cousin, a young Harvard student named Franklin Roosevelt. He was dashing and handsome and was considered a very good catch for her. Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt fell in love, but Franklin's mother was not very happy about the relationship. She sent Franklin off on a trip to Europe to try and break them up, but of course it didn't work. The couple married on March 17, 1905 in New York City. They had children right away and six of them. While Franklin was serving as assistant Navy secretary during World War I, a rumor surfaced that he was having an affair with his secretary, Lucy Mercer. Eleanor found love letters from Lucy. She did at one point consider leaving, but that would have ended his political aspirations. In 1921, Franklin Roosevelt contracted infantile paralysis, losing mobility in his legs. Eleanor cared for him and encouraged his return to politics. In an odd way, his inability to get around freed her. She started to get involved in political causes. She got involved with the League of Women Voters. She got involved with the Democratic Party. The great American public has its say at the polls, and the result is a Roosevelt victory of amazing proportion. When Franklin Roosevelt was elected president of the United States in 1933, Eleanor saw the office of First Lady as a way to expand on her previous work. The first thing she did was create a way of having a constituency of her own. So she created a role that simply hadn't existed before. Eleanor Roosevelt was criticized pretty heavily by some for her active role in public policy. As First Lady, Eleanor pioneered the use of mass media to communicate directly with the public. By having a women-only press corps, which she did, she was able to reach across the country. Eleanor Roosevelt leveraged mass media as a way to connect with the people at a time when the nation was bleak, literally coming out of the Great Depression. Eleanor Roosevelt further strengthened her legacy in her fight for equal rights during World War II. 
During the war, she famously went to the Tuskegee Air Base because black officers, they weren't being deployed. And she insisted on going up with one of the African-American pilots. And that after that, they did get deployed. On April 12th, 1945, Eleanor Roosevelt's husband died after suffering a stroke early in his fourth term as president. She wasn't there, and she learned sometime afterwards that Lucy Mercer was there. She told reporters after he died, and they said to her, Mrs. Roosevelt, what are you going to do now? She said, the story is over. But of course it wasn't. In the years following the White House, Eleanor Roosevelt remained an active political figure. In 1945, President Truman asked Eleanor to be a delegate to the United Nations General Assembly. Eleanor Roosevelt was very active. She really tried to force the United Nations to take a very hard, strong, active role in combating abuses toward human rights. Eleanor Roosevelt chaired the committee that drafted and passed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. She considered that her greatest achievement. Eleanor Roosevelt died at her Manhattan home on November 7, 1962. She was 78. Mark Twain is now thought of as America's first celebrity okay. because he well, was so good. Nice about Mark Twain, but anyway, um, I think that's a nice little uh, little wrap up. And of course, I will remind you that um, during all of this, she still maintained these relationships with Lorena Hickok and Earl Miller. Hickok died in 1968, four years after Eleanor died, and Earl Miller lived to 1973. Uh, so uh, there was this lifelong relationship. We have the letters of Lorena. We don't have the letters with Earl. Uh, but, you know, I just wanted to add that little bit to this final overview. So, whoo! Uh, with all of that said, I remind you that you can do much more of a comprehensive look at Eleanor's life by taking a deeper dive, number 66 on my website, makingwings.net. And now, if you would like, um, it's time to hear some of your thoughts and ideas. So thank you very much and uh, happy Women's History Month. <laughs>